I was contracted for a short time at an undisclosed location, a military base underground in the desert. For some background, I was in the Marine Corps for about six years when I got out. I worked for several different companies with the government. When I got out of the Marine Corps, I was not emotionally or financially stable enough to re-enter the civilian world. So, after talking to somebody in the Department of Defense, I took a job at this particular base. I did know what I was getting into, but I knew it would be better than jumping out of a plane or simply blowing things up. I had heard rumors about strange bases and all kinds of top secret projects over the years, but I had never seen any proof of their existence until I began working on this particular base. It was a hot base, meaning that we had active duty personnel as well as contractors working there. The first couple months were all pretty uneventful, except for the fact that my security clearance kept getting higher and higher. I was working in a very small office with only six desks in the room with five other people. I was the low man on the totem pole, so I got stuck in the back room with no windows. The walls must have been soundproofed with foam. Whenever somebody slammed a file cabinet door or dropped something on their desk, it sounded like a bomb going off. One day, my boss told me to follow him, and he took me down a series of hallways until we got to a special room. Inside this room were shelves and shelves of computers and what looked like either contraptions made out of metal or other materials. He informed me that these were real alien artifacts from a crash site located in Roswell, New Mexico. These were replicas from the late 1940s, and they looked pretty new. I have no idea how they made these or got these, but they also had several other replicas and models of other devices built by engineers who had studied them. I kept asking my boss questions about these artifacts. He kept brushing me off and would tell me to focus on the work. I couldn't stop thinking about them, so I tried to do some digging on my own. It was not very long before I started finding my own things. We had several different projects going on and everybody worked in a cubicle with a desk, a chair, and a computer. On the opposite wall of the room were several bulletin boards with different memos, white papers and reminders. I was at my desk one day, looking for a copy of an email when I noticed that there were several memos up there, top secret ones, and did not have the clearance level next to them. It was the titles of these memos that struck me as odd. So, I decided to print them off and take them back to my desk. I will list the titles. I have no idea what they mean. Project Grudge. Operation Bluefly. MAJIC-12. The project names intrigued me, so I printed them off and took them back to my desk. I opened up Google and typed in Project Grudge and Operation Bluefly. The only thing that came up were people asking what these projects were, and conspiracy theorists saying they were watching them. To make a long story short, I spent hours and hours looking through various government documents, especially anything that had to do with projects or memos about aliens. My curiosity was driving me crazy. To say that I got to talking to it was a bit of an understatement. Shortly after I was monitored, I had a talking to for observing and looking over these documents. I was actually transferred to a base across the country with all my clearance redacted. I was told the entire reason I was transferred was due to a bad attitude and not compliant with my job. Of course, that was on paper, but the real reason was because they were investigating me. They wanted to know what I had found and who I was talking about. What started out as a favor to one of my best friends ended with me being transferred to another state, having to start all over again. Fortunately, I kept copies of everything I had found, all the documents. About two months after my arrival at the new base, three weeks before I was about to be rotated out of the service, I was called into an interrogation room, grilled for about three hours before someone from my old base. I was told that I could not speak of anything I had seen read or heard. They also made me sign several non-disclosure agreements and federal documents. My life was threatened if I ever planned on leaking any of this information. I guess we'll see what happens now. I'm going to go by the name of John Doe for this email. The short of it is this. Don't talk to anybody about anything you see 
read or hear at your job if it is not given to you on a silver platter. Government and military jobs are very dangerous for your mental health. Believe me. I don't know what they do to people who talk about the things they know, but I do know what they told me, and I'm going to have to be very careful. My background is neuroscience and biology. Nothing out of the ordinary for an academic. I've worked for multiple pharmaceutical companies. I was even one of the early employees at Eli Lilly's neuroscience division and at a medical device company. I was in college during the tail end of the Cold War when Regan was in office and the evil empire was still around. I had a couple of friends who were on top secret clearances as part of some army intelligence programs. I'll call them John and Pat for the story. John was one of the smartest people I ever knew. Genius level IQ. Easily in the top 1% of people. Pat was in John's same grad school program. They were part of a special operations unit in the U.S. Army, working on top secret biological warfare research, believe it or not. I don't know all the details, but they were most likely involved in creating pathogens. John and Pat were tight-lipped about their project, for obvious reasons, but they were pretty open about how easy it was to create biological weapons. They mentioned the possibility of maybe having created some sort of pathogen that was incurable. John had a brother, even, who worked at Fort Detrick. John talked about him crying when he found out what they were working on. His brother told him that nobody would believe them if they ever spilt the beans about what was really going on. Years go by. John and Pat get out of the army and are immediately enlisted in this government project that was busy investigating various chemical and biological agents. They were tasked with creating new kinds of pathogenic weapons. I forget what they called it, but basically, they were trying to create new strains of pathogens that they could then use in experiments on animals. They were tasked with finding the best way to create new pathogens without being detected. They were able to take samples of various kinds of engineered viruses and use them as a vector for a new kind of pathogen. Test each one on animals. This would allow them to learn a lot about the best way to create new pathogens without having to use them. John and Pat said this was really easy, even without using live viruses as vectors. They could simply extract the genetic material from the pathogen, find a vector so it could be transferred into another organism, like harmless bacteria, for example, and then test it. The product of this kind of experiment is a pathogen that can be used as a weapon, but it would be a biological weapon that can never be traced back to its source. At some point in their tenure at this project, and they received a call from the Pentagon. They were told that one of the samples they'd been testing was extremely dangerous, and it had somehow gotten loose. They were told to pack up their stuff immediately and leave the premise, and not say a word about what had happened and what they had worked on. They were discharged, for lack of a better word, from the project altogether and given $200,000 each in settlement under the table. They had no idea how it happened that this pathogen had got out of the lab, but it was later very quickly contained by military personnel before ever reaching civilian territory. Shortly thereafter, John and Pat were immediately moved into the bioweapons division that worked on creating humanoids of various kinds by intersplicing DNA of a variety of species with the ultimate goal, to create a superhuman soldier. I don't remember the details he told me, but they worked on creating a new type of being with superhuman abilities, that if it ever escaped, it would be virtually unstoppable. Fortunately, that has not happened. Pat told me that because of his past history, John was considered a security risk, and he was not allowed to be anywhere near the facility where this new type of being was being created. Pat apparently wasn't allowed on site, only on the periphery of where he would be stationed looking at security feeds. I asked Pat what had happened with this bioweapons division. He told me that it started as a joint CIA and military project, but it fell more and more into the control of military as its life went on. Pat had suspicion that something had happened. Apparently, there was a falling out between the head of CIA and the CIA eventually lost total control of the project. I don't really remember the details, but he said it soon became very obvious at some point 
that the military was now conducting experiments, creating new weapons based on designs and ideas from this project. Pat had a feeling that they were in some way responsible for creating a new kind of pathogen, and they would use it in some experiments in the field. I don't remember who they were experimenting on, but Pat said it was very obvious that they were no longer in control. There's a lot more to the story, but I asked him if he can give me some specific examples of something that had happened in the field. He told me he'd have to think about it. The next time we talked, he told me that it seemed like all the lawsuits that came out of the U.S. soldiers who were exposed to something in Iraq, that's what it seemed like to him. I even asked him if he could explain that a little bit better, since I was having trouble understanding. He told me that at first, there were rumors and concerns about a new type of pathogen, and then that's when lawsuits emerged. He thinks they were being told to put soldiers from Iraq into quarantine. He thinks that's what the lawsuits were about, as if there was some sort of big cover-up. I asked him if he can tell me more about what had happened. Was this some sort of new virus? He explained no but he was not allowed to tell me any more than that. He's already spoken too much. I don't want to push him, so we moved on with the conversation. Going back to the bio life forms that they were working on, he informed me that several of these subjects were still being created and worked on today. They were initially designed to be used during the Iraq war in the early 2000s, but for reasons unbeknownst to him, the plug was somehow pulled and bioweapons were not used. That was part of the reason 9-11, I guess, was originally conducted, was due to pressure from the CIA, military, and other shadow branches of government, putting pressure to have means to test these new subjects. Of course, among many other reasons, but that's a rabbit hole he did not dive deep into. Again, he thinks the U.S. government has used these new life forms in some capacity, and it's most likely happening without people even realizing. He said, during his time, they were working on humanoids, and the project was still in its infancy when he left. He stated that they were nowhere near mature enough to be used, and that the only reason he was still employed at the facility is because they needed people to help run these experiments. This was, of course, the pre-alpha stage, as he calls it. He said that they would bring these deformed humanoids to him, and he was supposed to experiment on them, but there was a lot more going on behind the scenes. Of course, this was all before he was banned from the facility, from only working the security feed. And long before John was banned, Pat had been told that he was being used to run tests on these humanoids. But there were other things going on where he was also being used to experiment with. One of these said experiments was the J-Rod, who became well known for making contact with several other high-ranking military and government officials. Again, he did not go into detail but mentioned there were these groups that put together made up various divisions of the military to make contact. He did not want to go into any further detail with that. I told him I understood. I asked him if there was anything else he wanted to add, and he told me that the whole time he was working there, he was still trying to figure out what the whole facility was about, and that's why it took him so long to leave. It wasn't until he began to see the humanoids that he began to realize it was something more than just military experiments. Pat said that at the time, the facility was beyond top secret, and that even most of his co-workers didn't know exactly what they were doing. At first, this was before the experiments really began. They had to go in blind at first, while things were being set up. They were forbidden to ask too many questions. He even told me the only reason why he was able to see the humanoids is because of his rank and his tour of duty. Most people were not allowed to see them, and the ones who did had their lives threatened. Pat stated that he is fairly certain that the old facility is now sold, and it's now a part of an advanced military-industrial complex. He also mentioned that there are corporations involved with whatever is going on. He said that part of what made it so difficult to leave was because there were people watching him, and he knew that if he left with the sensitive information he had, his life could be threatened. He was also scared that the new military personnel at the facility might try and do harm to him or his family. The reason I told this story to the person I did is because it was something that really stuck out in my mind. When he said it knew that I had to share it with somebody, and this site seemed like a good place. That was the first I'd ever heard of Pat talking about the facility. And when I think about it, he still knows a lot of information. 
he was in charge of a good portion of a large military base after all. Pat has been retired for quite some time now, and he's in his late 60s. I think it's fair to say that he's old enough and retired enough not to necessarily fear for his life. Pat has lived a full life at this point. In conclusion, I hope you take the information here to heart and understand that our government and military do not have your best interest. We are but cattle for them to slaughter and experiment on. Our lives mean nothing to the greater good of humanity and country. These kinds of things, not specifically bioweaponry, but experimenting, have been going on for a very, very long time. I think we're just now seeing a lot of it coming to the surface, and it's scaring people. Remember to always think for yourself, and know that eventually the truth will come out. One final quick note. All the information here might seem disorganized and disingenuous, but all the intel I've gathered for you is a combination of intel I've gathered from over years and years of conversations with Pat and John alike. So, if there's any details that overlap or don't make sense, just know that and try to put all the pieces together yourself. Besides, I've given you all the information. I hope this is enough. Due to the nature of the email and the sensitivity, I've changed my name. My name is L, and for years, I worked top security clearance at a military base deep in the foothills in Montana. I need you to hold on for me and swallow the pill because things I worked on out of this base were straight out of a science fiction flick. I'm talking particularly about time travel. Part of the project I had a hand in playing I won't say which, because our team was larger, and I don't want to be singled out by what I did, therefore getting traced back to me. But we helped the military and government establish a connection to what we now know as alternate realities, or universes, something that is newer to pop culture. But back in the 70s and 80s, it was a groundbreaking, top-secret discovery. These are realities that coexist within our own timeline, but things have been slightly altered. It was my understanding, while working on the project, we were not able to go back in time and affect our own timeline. But the timeline of other realities was something we could do. One interesting thing is the few people they did send back, many of them had to be treated medically before being sent back. The reason being, the bacteria in the air and around you and around people change from time to time. For example... If you were to go back right now to 1623, you would probably die pretty quickly due to an overload of foreign bacteria your body is not used to. Sure, you do have an immune system, but there's no way you would be able to build up an immunity fast enough to survive. Even going back to simply 1921 can kill a man. Let's just say that there were procedures done on our subjects to ensure this went fine. Many of our subjects died during the course of having their atoms disintegrated while well, going, too, but some were successful. It wasn't so much as time portals as it was a gateway to another space and time. Think of it like harnessing the power of a black hole, in essence. We were simply bending space and time to visit other planes. There were no major missions to go back and change the course of history. Rather, just experiment to control the technology and to have that. The Chinese government has been working on this technology for years, and we were told when we were successful, they are actually ahead of us by about three. They have already apparently changed multiple timelines, which, by the way, there are several billion, and that's a fairly low estimate. When subjects are sent back to a specific time frame, they are medically prepped for that era, as well as stripped of all clothing and are aesthetically equipped for their time. This way they can blend in seamlessly without drawing attention to themselves. The purpose of all this is, from what I've been told, is to gather large amounts of intel. The Chinese government is using this technology for more nefarious and selfish reasons. We had a test campaign once. Our equipment proved to be successful with going back over 70 years in the alpha phase. We, well, I guess you can say, changed a timeline permanently. One mission, for example, was going back in October of 1942 months before the events of Pearl Harbor, and completely washed away the island of Japan, using advanced sonar weaponry, 
causing massive earthquakes and tsunamis all around the island. This was just to prove the type of power and potential that we had. It was an experiment run. And safe to say, within six days of our first subject going back to that time period, Japan ceased to exist. Therefore, Pearl Harbor had never happened and changed the entire course of modern history after that, for that timeline. Our man was pulled back in. Whatever events have taken place in that timeline since, we will never know. I need to be very careful now with how much information I release, so for this time, I'm going to stop here and let you digest that. I'll try and follow up shortly, but I have to be careful. Take care. In 2000, I worked in a branch of Navy that dealt with intel and advanced bio-research. On September 12, 2000, we got word that we were to go on a deep expedition 329 miles south off the coast of Maui in search of a supposed sunken fleet of ships that had mysteriously vanished back in the 1970s, but was ultimately covered up from press. Nobody except certain branches of military even knew about it. Researchers in that area had detected some very unique sonar signatures that could be nothing but man-made metal objects at record-breaking depths of about 5,200 meters. Before I get too far into the story, let me start with some background information you should probably use. I'm 38 years old at the time of this story. I had just got out of the Navy after serving for six years having already gotten an early discharge because of my outstanding service. I'm only sharing this with you because I want you to know that I'm very intelligent, and I know this story is going to sound outlandish to a civilian like you. I had been stationed on the USS Glacier in Antarctica for two years, and when I finished my tour, I was assigned to the U.S. Navy's underwater bio-research lab. I had a position parallel to a few members on the team. I was officially their security officer, but they had me doing anything from feeding the dolphins to recording and entering in data. I basically had free reign of the lab, which was not a normal thing. My career in the Navy was built on my knowledge of wildlife, which is why I was assigned to the Antarctica mission, where I did a stint of service that I cannot talk about what I did. I guess I had better get to the story. A few months before our mission, I was assigned to an escort of scientists who was gathering water samples for research. I didn't like the guy because he had no regard for me or my time, and when we were coming up to the port after a few days at sea, he failed to reattach the anchor line, and we drifted out too far away from our ship. I had to call in divers for that ship to hook us back up. The scientist was humiliated, and I didn't care for him much. We got a distress call from our sister ship, the USS Berg at around midnight, which was two days into our expedition before we could even get to the area. Apparently, a man had gone overboard, and the Berg had lost visual contact with him. They sounded off the alarm, and 20 of us immediately began to scour the area for any signs. He was missing for about an hour when he showed up at the surface. He was in a state of shock and wasn't talking much. One week went by, I guess, before he could speak in complete sentences. But during this time, he developed a sudden illness that progressed to the point where he was unable to speak altogether. He eventually passed away. We still don't know why. The research we were doing off the coast of Maui was meant to identify and locate these three ships that had vanished in the fall of 1972. They were now believed to have sunken in this perimeter. My job was to lead a small team into the deeper sections of the ocean with high-resolution sonar equipment, which required me to be on a submersible vessel and locate the crash site. Our team got out to the location at hand and began our submersion. The type of vessel we were in was a small sub, capable of holding no more than seven of us comfortably. The maximum depth it could go was roughly 6,500 meters, but the only thing we were interested in at this time was right around the 5,200 meter mark. That's where our equipment was getting a reading from. So we all knew or speculated that this was the hot spot the sub was able to travel at speeds of up to five knots, and we had a large sonar array that could detect objects up to 500 meters in front of us. We began our descent. All of us on board were pretty ecstatic about our findings, 
and that everything would be grand once we got deep enough to trace the location. That was until we got roughly to the 4300 meter mark. At this depth, we lost all of our forward skinning abilities, and that was the first time I felt uneasy about this whole thing. We started to slowly sink. Our systems were malfunctioning, and there appeared to be some sort of electronic interference with our equipment. How could this be possible at such depths? There was no way that our signal could be interfered with at depths like these, to make sense of something so strange. Our front lights were operating the entire time, but some of our systems were live and active, but our propulsions were not operating. After some success of maybe 30 minutes, everything seemed operating again smoothly, and we continued our descent down to around the 5200 meter mark, where the ocean floor rested. We had finally arrived at the required depths, and we were now thoroughly skinning the floor for any sign or trace of the wreckage. We were in the vicinity of where our equipment was leading us. Now this is where our story changes from one of exploration to desperation and danger. We get hit yet again with another wave of electromagnetic pulse, shutting down our entire system, but yet again leaving on the very front lights of the ship. These were casting lights several hundred meters in front of us, but our internal lights began malfunctioning yet again. We're trying our best to keep our cool and not to panic. We were now slowly descending until we crashed onto the ocean floor. Fortunately, we were only maybe 20 meters from the ocean floor, so landing didn't really do much damage, but now we're sitting ducks. In a brief moment, this massive wave smacks into our ship. With so much force, it hits us and causes us to topple several meters in the air, broadside. We panic, on top of trying to regain ourselves. We felt helpless, but to wait for the right moment. We had no propulsion capabilities, and our sonar equipment was down and going wacky. I remember thinking to myself, what made that giant wave down here? The movement in the water was so sudden, and my mind went to a place I did not even want to acknowledge. For a sudden force of that nature to happen would have to have been made by something of substantial size, meaning a large life form. I heard a sudden scream from my team. I turned to look, and there, fully illuminated by our spotlights, was this eye. What I'm telling is like straight out of a scene from Godzilla or something. This massive eye staring back at us. And just then, it quickly moved upwards. And as our lights are shining on it, we can see it's attached to something colossal in size. But, due to the size and force of this thing's sudden movement, alone, we are hit with yet another wave, knocking us back even more, damaging our systems, sending us flying, toppling all over. Some of us fell unconscious for a time, but we tried everything we could to get the ship back going. Our internal ship's core was now failing after taking the damage from getting banged so badly. I tried my best to radio to the surface, but it was dead. Our sonar was still down, but our systems would intermittently flicker on and off for a brief functionality. I knew in that moment I needed to do all I could to get these systems back going. It's as if we had been getting hit with waves of electromagneticism, as if this life form we had encountered was like that of a colossal-sized electric eel. In a way, the sonar was now back online, but it had been damaged. I can remember hearing a high-pitched signal come from it before it completely failed. I know this will be hard to believe. The sonar was now working, and the radio began working just briefly. I frantically radioed up to the surface, letting them know there was something down here, screaming at them, and we were aborting the mission. The sub was able to pull itself from the wedge of rocks it was up on, and we were beginning to successfully make our ascent back to the surface. That's when I got a reply from up top, and they told us, You are to continue on with your mission. The tone of their voice was commanding. I don't remember much after that, but I do remember failing to continue with the mission against my own will by forcing myself to stay awake from the lack of oxygen. Much of our internal systems were still glitching, and I wasn't sure 
if we were going to be able to make it to the surface without the systems failing and us sinking back down again. We reached the 4600 meter point, all before our internal systems began glitching out yet again. We pushed harder and harder to press onward, when at about another 200 meters, our systems turned off, failing us yet again. Our impact on the ocean floor had now severely damaged our vessel. We were now free-falling down to the very bottom of the floor, roughly a thousand meters below us, slowly. This is when I realized, we're going to die. We were already on limited oxygen, and we would not withstand very long. We're sinking quickly. When we get hit with yet another wave of current from what I could only assume to be that large life form we had seen that shot out, twirling down into the bottom of the ocean floor. This impact knocked all of us out. Oxygen was now depleting. We were going to die. I lost consciousness. I cannot tell you how much time had passed, but I awoke to our vessel slowly ascending in the water. We were being propelled up by a large sub-vessel that was taking us up to the surface. It turns out the ship above us had sent a vessel to come get us and was able to reach us just before we ended up dying due to oxygen deprivation. That's not to say we didn't endure long-lasting problems from having that much lack of oxygen. We were brought to the surface, treated for our injuries and, of course, reprimanded and questioned why our duties were not done, why we failed to complete orders. I briefly informed them that what had happened down there to all of us and the mission was not worth our lives. We were also let go, with strict word not to speak about anything we saw, the location of the vessels, the site, or any other sensitive information that they would deem. We were forced to sign documents and lots and lots of paperwork. I'd been wanting to tell my story for years, and I think it's about time. I'm submitting this to an anonymous database, so whoever gets this can unveil it. For the record, my age has changed, and important details about my life, like the years in service that I was in, have all been altered to further protect my identity. While the information in this story are real events, my background and other information is just a placeholder. I hope whoever reads this understands. My name is not important. However, I need to tell this story. So, these events happened when I was in the military. The events in 1979 were so bizarre and so chilling to the men involved that nobody has discussed them publicly, at least not yet. I have been asked not to discuss them. This is the only place where I can tell my story, so here it is. I served in the U.S. Army from 1978 to 1986. During that time, I was stationed at the Tuzla Air Base in Tuzla, Bosnia, formerly part of Yugoslavia, with the 10th Infantry Division. I was a chemical decontamination specialist, which meant I would go out on patrol with the line companies and decontaminate the soldiers and their equipment after they were exposed to chemical warfare agents. I was trained to do this using the M258A1 decon kit, which I carried on my back. It weighed roughly 150 pounds. This thing wasn't small or light to carry. It was a workout. In 1979, our platoon sergeant called us all together, said we were going to participate in a special mission. We were excited as anything that breaks up the day-to-day -day monotony of guard duty and drills is welcome to soldiers, regardless of their rank and position. We were already a pretty tight unit, so we were happy to do whatever we needed to for our fellow soldiers. The platoon sergeant pulled out a map, showed us where we were going. The island of Vis, a small Croatian island in the Adriatic Sea. We were informed that our mission was to conduct reconnaissance on Vis, and that we would be inserted via helicopter to scout the island and make contact with whatever forces were already there. We were told that we would be inserted on the south side of the island and be picked up on the north side. That night, we boarded the chopper and flew to Vis. We were inserted on the south side of the island near a small fishing village, which was mostly abandoned at this time due to military presence. 
There were some inhabited houses and a small church with a cemetery adjacent to it. I am not sure what that church is, but I do remember a large cross atop its steeple. The pilots said the locals would not approach the island, at least this section, rumored to be cursed. Although, I don't believe that. We walked about a mile to an area where we could dig in and set up observation posts, otherwise known as OPs. We dug shallow fighting positions and set up a central OP on a small hill overlooking the town. My friend, who was a specialist for in my unit, and I decided to set up our OP on top of a large rock overlooking the area. We were able to construct an A-frame out of some smaller limbs and camouflage netting. This way, we would have some protection from being observed. My friend said he had a bad feeling about this mission, but I laughed it off. I knew he was a little off, but not many soldiers are comfortable with being shot at. So I thought this apprehension was due to the amount of lead in the air when we were fleeing from Kuwait. We set up our OP, camouflaged it, and laid out our MOPP gear in case we needed to go chemical anytime soon. We had our gas masks, chemical protective suits, or MOPP suits, rubber boots, chemical gloves, and of course, our M25 8A1 decon kits. We watched the town through our scopes for about an hour, and we began noticing what we thought were Yugoslavian soldiers moving around. They were dressed in uniforms, similar to that of the Soviet era, but it was different. They even had the red stars and caps. They were at the far end of the village, nearest to us, when without warning, they began running towards our OP. I grabbed my N16 and told my friend that we are going chemical. I grabbed my mast, and there was a bright flash of light. When I could see again, the soldiers were gone. My friend and I looked at each other and realized we both experienced the same thing. We decided to go check it out. There was no sound. Nothing. As I looked at the trees under which the soldiers had been, I noticed that there was a light shimmer in the air where they had just passed. Kind of like a mirage. Like the air or time was moving. It looked very strange. My friend and I were about 75 yards away now from our own OP, and we saw something moving against the rock face. We froze and stared at it for a little bit, until we realized... It was some sort of lizard. The thing was black, about five feet tall, with a tail that was closer to a crocodile's. It had a very large head and was holding its body close to the rocks as it moved slowly. It was in a crouching position, and you could tell this was a bipedal being. It seemed to be looking for something, but I have no idea what. We continued back towards the OP, and we heard a sound we cannot describe but can only be said to have sounded like several people screaming all at once. It lasted for just a few seconds, and then there was silence. We approached our OP, but it was completely empty. We had left our rifles behind in the A-frame when we went to inspect the soldiers. We moved back to where we thought it was. When we got there, all that remained were our helmets, which had fallen over on their sides with the chin straps still buckled. We didn't think this was possible, we had secured our helmets to the A-frame because we knew that the enemy enjoyed to booby-trap our equipment. My friend and I went back to our OP. We searched for what was left for about 30 minutes. As soon as we reached the edge of the vegetation, it seemed to me that something was out there in front of us. As we walked closer, I realized that there was a group of bipedal creatures, roughly about the size of humans, standing just outside the vegetation line. They all appeared to be wearing some sort of suit covering their bodies. They were roughly nine of them, all standing together in a group. They were acting in a very strange manner, seemingly looking back and forth between my friend and I, with their heads moving almost like that of a bird, very cockeyed, as if they were viewing something from far away. My friend and I kept looking at each other, wondering what to do next. We began to slowly back away, but before we could take any more than a couple steps backwards... They walked in our direction, and they were moving fast, clearly agitated in their motion. And just as they were getting closer, another flash of light that blinded me. Once again, they were gone. At this point, we retreated back towards camp, waiting for the sun to completely come up. 
after we had made our way down the hill and back. Before very long, we noticed there was smoke coming from the distance. We decided to change our course in order to see if somebody needed help. As we began to move closer, I realized these were two separate fires. We stood and watched them for a while. After about ten minutes, we saw movement. There was a light shining down where the flames were, and what looked to be these same creatures that we had seen before. They seemed to be directing the fire somehow. I thought that it might have been the same group, but my friend pointed out that they all had different colored suits on. He said that some had red, others had blue, and there was even one that had green. We stood and watched them, and we realized that they were not alone. There was another group of them moving around in the vegetation, but they looked like humans, wearing bright green camouflage. This group eventually moved into the light of the fire, and we could see they were carrying weapons. One of the human-looking ones walked up to a tree and kind of did something with his hands. The tree lit up and began shooting out a beam of light from its trunk. The creatures slowly stepped back from it, all except one, and engulfed in this beam of light. We realized this was some kind of teleportation or doorway, so we very quietly backed away and ran back to our platoon, reporting what we had seen. I want to emphasize that the following is purely speculation, but after doing some research, I have come up with what I believe are some very valid possibilities. The first set of soldiers we saw were actually these reptilian beings, but disguised as humans in some sort of cloaking form. Let me share with you some information I've gathered. There are three main races of gray aliens, which are known to abduct humans or perform experiments on them. One of them is known as the Zeta Reticuli, discovered in the 1950s by an amateur astronomer. The other two are reptilian, also humanoid, and insectoids. There are often races referred to as Nordics and Greys. Nordics are usually described as being humanoid in appearance with pale white skin and blonde hair. Insectoids can be the average human being height, if not more, and are primarily humanoid insectoid beings. The most common are mantis humanoids. The fire they were controlling looked like some sort of portal. When the beam shot out, it was like a teleportation device. I believe that these beings could be experimenting on humans in order to try and create an army to use against us. Maybe they are trying to use the humans in some sort of fighting force, I don't know. It is possible that this might be some sort of retaliation for the Vietnam War. The person who I was with during this who was also my co-witness, passed away from cancer many years ago. We were stationed at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. This was back in 1990. I was still a newbie on my first deployment. I had been in the Army for 11 months and was still considered in the training phase of my military occupation specialty. I was 19. There were six other guys out with me on a mission and I was the designated driver. This was a training mission from hell. We were on a recon mission for some reason or another, and we were out of sight of earshot. Out in the countryside as we were, you could used to seeing wildlife skitter past and hearing it as well. A deer would constantly amble across the roads. Rabbits, raccoons, jackrabbits, and all sorts of birds would be seen very frequently. I was driving the lead vehicle, a two-man jeep with all sorts of radios, they were not much for comfort, but they sure got the job done. I drove us down a long stretch of road, when in my rearview mirror, I noticed something large and black run off to the left side of the road, into the woods. Once we got past where it had vanished, I thought nothing of it, other than that it must have been a deer or something. After all, it was the middle of the afternoon, and I had seen all sorts of wildlife out here before. It wasn't until the sun had started to set again that I now noticed it. I looked out to my right and saw a large black figure, maybe 500 feet away. It was shambling out of the woods and into a clearing. It was roughly man-sized, but it did not walk like a man. It walked slowly and awkwardly, almost as if it were hurt. It was hunched over, and the way it moved its arms, I couldn't quite see what its hands were like. All I could make out was that it was black, 
but had no discernible clothing or anything on it. It also appeared to be extremely muscular. I sat there in awe for a moment, pondering what it could be. I decided to pull over and find out. I stopped the jeep, turning off the engine. There were no other vehicles in sight, so I thought it was safe to get out. I pulled my rifle off my shoulder and slung it. I grabbed my field radio, switching it on, keying the mic to broadcast to all of us. Hey, is anyone else seeing this? I'd whispered. All the radios buzzed with static for a moment, and then one of my squad mates answered. Yeah. I don't know, but you should see it too. I said, as I walked around the jeep to get a better look. He told me he couldn't see it, and said, what is it? It's in the clearing. It's big and black, and I can't really see well. Is it on the road? He had asked. No, it's in the clearing to my right. It's walking right there towards the tree line. I'm going to try and get closer. So they told me, wait. I gave a few quick glances back and forth behind me, checking to make sure nobody else was there, and then I carefully crept towards the clearing. I finally got up to the tree line, looking through the trees. It was gone. My squad mate appeared over the radio. Hey, I can't see it. Where is it? I don't know. It was right here, I swear. I'd whispered back. That's not possible. I wouldn't have seen it. Well, I'm telling you it was here, I said, pulling my field radio off my belt and switching it back off. We sat there a few moments, waiting to see if it would reappear in the clearing. It did not. At this point, I was pretty freaked out and decided to head back to the jeep. I walked with my rifle at the low ready, pointed at the ground, but with my finger resting on the trigger. I didn't tell them that I was heading back yet. I wanted to see if it would reappear. I got back to the clearing and took a look around. Nothing. I turned and headed back to the jeep. I was walking away from it. Then a scream came out on the radio. My squad mate screamed. I shouted back. I heard him scream again. I shouted what again, as loud as I could, without attracting the attention from the other jeep. He did not answer. I asked what was going on. So I ran back to the jeep and jumping in. I didn't see the radio man anymore. What's going on? Where did everybody go? He had asked. Before I could answer, there was a crashing through the trees. We both jumped out of the jeep to see what it was. What we saw will haunt us for the rest of our lives. It was my squad mate. He was screaming, running straight toward us. He was bleeding from multiple gashes, and he had this black thing chasing him. Whatever the black thing was, it wasn't human. It was a mangled, twisted black figure moving like a man, but not quite human. My buddy from the jeep and I stood there frozen in horror, watching our friend run towards us. We didn't know what to do. When my buddy saw that her friend was being chased by this thing, he turned and ran back. I just reacted, grabbed my rifle, pointed it directly at this being. I pulled the trigger, firing a spray of bullets on him. I don't know if it hit him or not, but he stopped. And when I stopped shooting, he then began to advance on me. I was about to take another burst at him when my friend jumped in the jeep and shouted for me to get in. I jumped in the jeep beside him after getting out to shoot at this thing, and he throws it into reverse and punches the gas. The tires spun, gravel flying everywhere as he tried to get us turned around for a quick exit. He finally got us pointed in the right direction, and we went flying back out the way we came. I looked behind us for any sign of that thing, but I couldn't see it anymore. As we drove on, I could hear my friend whimpering next to me. He had his hand pressed against the deep, oozing gash in his right arm. I reached into the first aid kit and pulled out a field dressing. Here, put this against the wound. He took it, pressed it against the injury, but not before I saw his fingers were raw and red. He had somehow gotten that gash without realizing it when he was running from the creature. We can now hear this thing chasing our jeep in the woods. It was paralleling us from inside the woods, but just outside of you. We could hear it crashing around. This was impossible. I had shot it several times, and it should have been hurt badly enough to be able to not keep up with us. After a few more minutes, the crashing in the woods stopped. And my buddy grabbed my shoulder and said, Don't look back. So what do I do? I immediately turned around and looked back behind us. 
there were several of these beings running after us in the woods. I looked back at my buddy, and he was white as a ghost. I was trying to make out just how many there were, easily over four or five, and they shouted, What are they? I don't know, but we're not sticking around to find out. He nodded, and we kept going as fast as the jeep would allow us. The radio man is screaming, Guys, what is that? And we shouted, We don't know. Guys, we heard the gunshots. What is going on out there? My buddy overcame his fear for a moment, trying to explain what he saw as best as he could. I looked back and saw that those things were now running through the woods beside us, keeping pace with our jeep. This was unreal. I don't know how long we drove, but eventually the jeep stopped in front of a guard shack at the same kind of base. I couldn't make out the insignia in the dark, but it did not look like anything I'd ever seen before. We got out of the jeep and ran into the shack. The two guards manning the gate had their weapons pointed at us. What is the emergency? My buddy stumbled, trying to catch his breath, and explained, We, we were headed to the front gate. And the other guard spoke, his voice low and calm. Slow down, son. What is your emergency? My friend finally caught his breath long enough to speak. There is a thing chasing us. We informed him we were still in training and we ran into something in the woods to please help us. This thing chased us all the way here. The guards looked at each other and then the closest one to my friend pulled him over to a corner for a private conversation. I couldn't hear what was being said, but I could see my friend's face turn from fear to anger. The other guard approached me. I'm sorry, son. We can't let you in. I was taken aback by his words. What? I just saw my friend get attacked and chased by something and you're not going to let us in. The guard's voice was firm but calm. Truth is, you're not authorized to be here. I'm afraid we can't let you in. I was getting frustrated. Nobody comes into this base unauthorized. You have to understand that. Now please, get back in your jeep. I was dumbfounded. What's going on here? This is part of our base. The guards spoke in a firm and resolute tone. I understand you're upset. Now please, go. I looked back at my friend, who had a very defeated look on his face. I knew it was pointless to argue, and we had gotten out of there quickly, doing our best to evade whatever had chased us far into the woods. Everything had gone quiet, and we hadn't heard much of anything now. We eventually did make it back, and we were informed that what we had encountered was a part of our training mission. No further questions were allowed. The portion and part of our base that we had tried to enter into did not allow trainees in, including us, which was a strict part of a military facility. Everything was coordinated for us to encounter these beings by the military, as some sort of training operation. These are things I didn't learn until much later on. I went on to serve for a few more years and got out. I lost contact with all my buddies. In 1989... I was a U.S. Marine stationed at Camp Pendleton in Southern California as a platoon guide for Company B, 1st Battalion, 5th Marines. I lived on the base in Oceanside. I was a corporal, and being a second lieutenant meant it was impossible for me to have a roommate due to space limitations. My chief brought it up with me that I could live with him and his wife off the base if he wanted to. We were pretty close, so he offered it. It was here that the encounter really begins. I'll start with the first one. Living with the chief and his wife wasn't so bad at first, but where they live, we started to get, how do I say, nightly visits by these things. It started by hearing them just outside the window at night. I would hear heavy footfalls, branches breaking, lots of leaves crunching around. They would always be right over my window. I would just lay there, staring at the closed curtains, praying that whatever it was would just go away. I would always fall asleep before they did. Every night, it was the same thing. Except one night, I woke up to them just outside the window, breathing heavily on the glass, while watching me, drool and saliva all over the window. I'm not going to lie. This was downright terrifying. I was a Marine for God's sakes. I'm supposed to be able to protect myself. After that night, it was as if they knew I had seen them. They would come every night, but always to the front portion of the property where we had the largest windows and viewing portion of the front property. 
It's like these things wanted to be seen. I can never go back to sleep after that, so I would just stay up and wait for them to leave. These encounters continued on for several weeks. I had my other best friend, whom I'll call C. He was invited over to spend the night as well. It was around 2 a.m. when these things approached. I heard the usual noises outside the window, but this time, it sounded like more than one. I would see shadows pass by my bedroom window. Of course, my chief seemed totally clueless to all this and would spend his nights, drunk as a skunk, passed out in front of the TV. Go figures. C is another story. He is a marine veteran who had seen action in the Gulf War, and he knew what we were dealing with. I befriended him while on base, and, and we ended up meeting in the chow hall, where we became really good friends. So with all this going on, I would invite him over and my chief did not mind. I think my chief was pretty clueless to these things going on since he was always drunk and passed out by the time these things would show up. And after he was drunk, good luck waking him up, I would always ask C what it is we should do. He informed me that we were dealing with a very large upright bipedo canine. These things are alpha predators. They will kill. He had dealt with these himself while living up in Michigan for a short while. I went back to my chief and told him what was going on. He laughed it off said I was delusional. So at this point, I'm pretty convinced that he has no idea. It was at this point that I became very suspicious of him, that he didn't know anything. I think he was living in denial. After a few weeks of this, I was going to go live with my wife's sister up in San Diego. Now comes the best part of this experience. The first night, I didn't sleep there. I expected these things to be there right outside my window, although they never were. To say that first night at my new location was restless and sleepless is an understatement. I didn't realize in hindsight how this thing would really affect my overall sleep patterns. Anyway, I'm not sure what it was that I experienced that day, but it was something else. I'm still completely spooked by the whole thing just thinking back to it. I would prefer it if it just gets left in the past. I have done multiple tours to Iraq as of now and served in the last Gulf War, and Afghanistan. I've seen all kinds of combat up close, but this is an extremely personal story about my own life that I've never told anybody in as much detail. I'm currently in the reserve, so being called up is not an issue, but this is something that I kind of hesitate to tell. I'll start by introducing myself. My name is Brian. I'm currently 54. I'm a U.S. Army National Guard veteran. Previous to the Iraqi war, I was in active duty for roughly five years, until I was discharged with an injury. I am also a former U.S. Army Ranger who has seen over 18 years of active duty in the military alone, five of which were in Afghanistan. I probably should have been more specific. The rest were spent deep in the jungle and jungle warfare training, as well as engineer courses to improve various infrastructures all throughout the world. I will be sharing a story with you guys that I have never told anybody. It's not just a ghost story. It's something much more. The story takes place in 2002. I was stationed in Iraq. I had deployed alongside my brother, who was also serving in the U.S. Army Infantry Unit that took part in the initial invasion of Iraq. The majority of my unit was stationed there. We were working on rebuilding the local structures and bringing order to the cities. It was a relatively quiet tour, but we weren't without our share of action. I was involved in several engagements with the enemy, and even a few with what I can only describe as unknown humanoids. My brother's unit was stationed in the city of Tikrit, which was being used as a base for training of new Iraqi soldiers. These guys on the ground were doing some very important work, and they needed a place to stay where they could rest and train. I was brought into my unit because I was a demolitions expert with an additional engineering background. My sergeant had asked me to come in because they needed somebody who could blow up buildings while simultaneously rebuilding them. Metaphorically, of course, not literally. So, I was brought on the team where I was given a special set of engineering tools to meet the needs of my new unit. After much discussion, I was told when we were done, on our task, I would be transferred to Tikrit as a permanent member of my brother's unit. So one day, as I was working on the various infrastructure at the City Hall building, Waiting for my brother's unit to arrive, something happened. I don't know how to describe it accurately, so I'll just come right out with it. 
these flying entities, which reminded me of angels, descended down upon the town. The entities were looking something like large, eight-foot-tall humanoids. They looked like beings wrapped in garbs and had large wings. It appeared as if they were looking for something. I just tried my best to ignore it as I could and focus on my job. The worst thing you can do in the military is become distracted. It kind of impossible with this happening. A lot of the people were, of course, gasp and awe, but many of them were not even phased. They didn't even just descend down and start hovering. They flew in, but were very visible. Like I said, they were looking for something. I'll be as basic about it as I can be. They looked like winged humanoids. I just continued to try and focus on my work since I had a job to do. I was on the roof of the city hall building. When you're on the top of any building, you can see for miles. I was working on an antenna tower when I heard somebody yelling at me in the street. I was a level above the street, so people normally don't look up to find you unless they need something. He waved me down when I get to the edge, and he tried telling me something in Arabic. I can only say a few words like no and yes in Arabic, so I just continued to try and climb down the ladder. As I got closer, he began speaking in English, in an American accent actually, and he said, I know why they're here. Who? I asked him, trying to act naive and ignorant. He began telling me that the people of this town were going to die, that they had brought this upon themselves. He said they were an aberration and we should stop living in sin. I asked him what he meant, and he told me that these beings were sent down to annihilate us because we had let ourselves go. We had allowed things that shouldn't have been allowed, and we need to put an end to it. I couldn't understand what was happening. He then said he would be able to help me escape, but I had to go with him now. I figured at this point things were getting a little crazy with everything happening, so I continued to try and ignore it all. These figures had disappeared to another section of the city, and the man who was yelling at me had now disappeared. Other soldiers were talking about the sightings amongst themselves, but I tried my best to pay no attention to any of this and just continue to follow my orders. I was staying at my brother's unit, since he had chosen for me to come in and train with his unit. They were all stationed in a nearby city, so they knew it very well and were able to guide me. I told my brother what had happened that day. He didn't seem surprised. I asked him what he thought those beings were, and he said, They're called jinn. They disguise themselves as angels and trick many of the men around there. They are like genies, but not in the form of humans and bottles like many people think. They are entities that reside in another realm and can only interact with us when they choose to do so taking on a physical manifestation. They sometimes bring messages from the future. He told me there were two other jinn that lived in the area. These are demonic beings that can bring a terrible wrath upon mankind. They only take physical form when they have something to do. They are able to control and play with the human mind. They are not to be taken lightly. I couldn't believe what was happening. Nothing made sense. I was just simply trying to do my job and now I've been dragged into this whole strange alien conspiracy thing that did not even make any sense now. What was I supposed to do? Keep doing my job and not saying anything? Well, to make a very long story short, after returning from tour, I just felt different. Like I knew things that others didn't. I'm unsure of how to describe this feeling inside of me. I've lived with it for years now. Out of all my time serving... This was the only one that really reached into the left field for me. I worked as a technician in 2001 for the Joint Warfare Analysis Center in Suffolk, Virginia. That's not to say that I was a government employee, because all of us there were contractors of civil service personnel. I'd been with the company for four years by this time, and had risen to the position of Security Systems Specialist. My job was basically to work with the Sensitive Compartment Information Facility, a secure and sensitive room where information is handled. In the case, we were working with U.S. intelligence assets in theater during the lead-up to Operation Enduring Freedom, the invasion of Afghanistan. One of the things I saw during my time was a report generated by some assets on the ground in Afghanistan, having to do with an assimilation of alien life. I've heard all the same complaints that you people say, all about how the government lies for the people for nefarious purposes. Well, I'm going to divulge a little bit more to that. 
I was the second one in the morning, usually arriving at 0700 hours after having already dropped off my son. I always came back in the door of the facility to the security checkpoint. All visitors were expected to enter through there, and it was always under video surveillance 24-7. The main door from the outside wall next to the parking lot was unlocked during my arrival, and there would be two workers standing guard on either side of the door. Nobody was allowed to stand at the door alone, and both members of the entry team were required to swipe their badges through the reader before the door would unlock. This is due to the things that come in this section of the building. We got things from the NSA, CIA, and military, among other things. Things that civilian eyes are never allowed to see. I think this was some kind of alien technology, or biological entity. The military picked up during their numerous operations over there. We received some interesting stuff during my time there, like live alien foreign specimen of an unidentified species. Although I never saw it myself, Nobody was allowed in the room when the specimen was being worked on in the security in the section of our facility. There was always at least three technicians with access to that room. The specimen came on on a military cargo flight, although they never told us which one. It was kept in a large sealed container which had been airtight welded shut. Inside the container, there was this alien being. The military brass told us it was alien life form but none of us newer guys ever really saw it. The specimen was roughly four feet tall, humanoid, large head. It was kind of broad across the shoulders. Nobody ever told us what type of being it was. It was just an alien, conscripted by the military to be studied for battlefield applications. The one thing people did tell us about this stuff was that the brass didn't know exactly how it worked, but that we were to lock down the facility and let nobody in or out under any circumstances until they did know how it worked. We were all a bunch of 20-something technicians, so our contact with the higher-level brass was pretty much limited to the briefings they would give us, just about how to set up each new artifact or specimen that we got. During the initial setup, one of the guys from upstairs showed us how to set up a safe room for this particular specimen. They told us that it was a biological entity, and that there were always ways to keep it safe. There was a large bay, with several smaller rooms inside that we could use for this exact purpose. The safe room was a large sealed cube with several layers of sheet metal on the outside, airtight welded doors on the inside. It was designed to keep things in and out. This room would be used for any specimen with immediate, high-level containment requirements. During the brief, they told us that the entity inside could very easily escape if we're not extremely careful in how it was handled. They stressed that we were not able to open the doors for any reason, and under no circumstances could anybody be inside with it. I think this was because it could emit some kind of energy that would open the door, if left unattended. They also said something about how it was programmed to escape. The way the room worked is that they would slide one of those large square biohazard suits through a chute on the outside of the door. We would then have to put on these suits go inside with the large toolbox and slide the inner door shut from the inside before sealing it from the inside with a large metal brace. The toolbox would be used to open a panel on the inside door and access the locking mechanism of the room. The biohazard suits were used for this because there was no way to ensure the entity could not pass through. The first time, I had to go inside with another guy named Craig. Everybody was still really new at this. Everybody was tense. Nobody knew exactly what to expect. The outside of the room was huge, maybe 20 feet wide by 30 feet long. Craig and I walked into the small antechamber, and we could see this large metal brace running horizontally across the door. The safe room itself was built like a vault, with several metal walls, roughly 18 inches thick. I eased the toolbox to the chute and slid it over to Craig, who was standing near the door inside. Craig slid the inner door shut before fiddling with the locking mechanism for just a few seconds. I closed the small toolbox, opened up the panel inside to reveal a keyhole. I slid the brace into place and closed the door before turning the key over in the lock. The room was now very, very quiet. We would receive several more live specimens of beings sent directly from the military, Pentagon, and other branches that were housed in the same complex. By the time I was done with this job, we had nearly a dozen of these rooms and an assortment of other artifacts from around the world. Most of the specimens were pretty bizarre, even for a freak like me. 
I saw some things that you just can't unsee. They would take everything away in the middle of the night, while we were sleeping. Usually while I was still up drinking. Because, after seeing those things, nothing can make you sleep. This complex continued its operation until the very beginning of 2003, January, where they were moving the complex over to France. Unless you were okay with transferring, you'd have to find other means of work. I declined the invitation to go there, so I have no idea what's become of that faculty, but I'm sure from what I've been told by some guys that did decide to move over there, that I still have connections with, that faculty is much larger and houses many more things. They even joke about it, and call it the little house of horrors due to some of the specimens they have over there. I have kids and family, so I can't really talk about all the specimens I saw, just in case I ever get threatened or my family gets threatened. Sorry. These memories of working there still stand out to me as some of the craziest times. We were in Wales, in 1992, for training exercises. We were to spend the night in the woods on the outskirts of a small town, then head into town for some R&R. As usual, we were eating field rations and had just broken out onto our sleeping bags for the night, and we heard something large moving throughout the woods. A few of the guys from my platoon grabbed their rifles and went to investigate. A minute or two later, the most awful sound I had ever heard came from the woods, like the sound of somebody trying to scream while being strangled maybe 50 yards away at most. It wasn't human nor animal in nature, but it was loud. To this day, I struggled to find the words to describe it. It shook me up. A few minutes later, the guys come back from checking out the woods. They did not have a clue what it was. One guy swore he saw something weird, but he was also pretty shaken up too. We just need to forget about it. And I said, we can't just forget about it. I don't know what it was, but there's a chance it was a person. We need to go make sure. The guy who looked just seemed shaken and pale told me it was no person. I'm telling you, whoever it was, they're long gone by now. Well, I'm not just going to sit here and do nothing, I told him. If you guys are too scared to go back there, then I'll go check it out. At this, a few of the guys who had gone into the woods shook their heads, but most of them just stared at the ground. I'm going to go back there, I told him. So one of my friends, who was with me on the platoon, told me he would come with me, even though he did have a lack of enthusiasm. The rest of the platoon was less reluctant, and so we all headed back there, minus a few guys. Of course, we were not successful. Nothing was found, but we felt like we weren't alone out there in the wilderness. Anyway, that's my story. Haven't experienced anything else in the military quite like it. In 1947, I was heavily involved with the military, and I was also a pilot. I was assigned to work with an intelligence unit located right at the Pentagon. I was only 19 at the time, just out of high school. I was very idealistic, and I wanted to serve my country. I remember all the major newspapers and media outlets were talking about flying saucers. The news was all over the place about how these UFOs were appearing in the skies. Nobody was able to get them on radar, though. It was simply a pandemonium. Some people thought it was the Russians. Some people thought it was Sputnik. The media spread all kinds of crazy theories that were way ahead of their time. Most people thought these flying saucer things were some kind of top-secret government project, but they weren't sure what the government was actually doing about it. It didn't help that just months later, in 1948, the USS Macon had crashed into the Pacific Ocean, and the story broke that the Navy had been flying around in, apparently, giant airships. They also crashed, and it was never fixed. But we managed to keep it a secret for some time. In the meantime, the Pentagon told all of us that our job was to keep watching these things. They were always appearing somewhere. The stories were all over the place, but most of them were coming out of the Southwest. I remember my commanding officer telling us that if we spot one of these things to abandon our post, do not engage. If we were in a war zone, the order was to shoot first, ask questions later, like the recording in the transcript. It was a very stressful time. I remember your typical media outlets having a field day. Since there was no internet, you could turn on the radio. 
you'd hear all kinds of wild theories and explanations about what these things could have been. I was assigned to do a lots of research and analysis at the Pentagon. Most of what we were doing involved watching for saucers and checking out the military's radar systems. We were told to be on the lookout for attacks from Russia or any other Soviet-affiliated countries. I didn't see a flying saucer myself until 1952. It was one of the most frightening experiences that I had during my entire tenure in the military. I was in the Air Force at the time. At only about 23 or 24 years old, I was stationed in a small base near the Area 51 in Nevada. I was still working with the same unit, but now was much smaller. We had our own little compound on the base. That's where we constructed all of our work. The base didn't even have a name, so we called it S-4. And that's how everybody would refer to it at the time. We only had around six or seven people, including our commanding officer. The UFOs stopped appearing after 1952, because we apparently figured out how to catch them on radar using special technology. The media had stopped talking about them for a time, but things began to heavily escalate shortly before Vietnam, many years later. There was another incident in 1959. A military cargo plane had crashed into a remote section of the Sierra Nevadas. The wreckage was spread out across the mountains, and we had to do all kinds of intense field work to track every piece down. The Air Force informed us that these things weren't from Earth, what was on that plane. We had to secure the scene as best as we could. I was only a first lieutenant at the time and didn't really know much about these things until we began receiving orders from Washington that we had to abandon any and all posts until we found out what these objects were. I was interrogating one of the survivors from the crash. He was the only one who knew anything. He told me he didn't remember much about where they came from, but it wasn't of this universe. He had a lot of injuries and he was banged up pretty badly. We were told by our commanding officer to bring him back to the base at S-4. When I got to the base... I saw that the other officers were guarding an alien body that had crashed into the ground somewhere. It looked like a huge insect, but with two arms that were attached to its torso. It had a small head and body covered in hard chitin. It was very scary looking, but it had been dead for several hours. We didn't have to worry about it attacking us. Turns out this was a cargo plane carrying the bodies of aliens down towards Mexico. I got a chance myself to look at the body when my commanding officer told me about what the alien survivor had said. He explained that these things were very real, whatever they were. They were definitely not from Earth origin, and the government had known about these things for a long time. Even the survivor, who I won't name, was actually the second person on record to talk about them. It made me wonder if there was a survivor from the crash I found who was willing to spill the beans. And many of us in the military at the time referred to them by the others, they were very technologically advanced. So much so, they could have wiped us off the face of this planet if they had really wanted to. We were in a cold war with them, after all. We had been sending in our own transmissions into space for decades now. The signals we put out are very specific and include everything from mathematical equations to images of our solar systems. We have been doing it for a long time, so essentially telling them exactly where to find us as a part of our project... In 1965, we had a horrific incident at one of our undisclosed locations underneath Chicago. We had a secret foreign technology testing facility. Several subjects had begun to mutate, including some of the workers that were exposed to hazardous chemicals. The strange thing about this incident is that there were no survivors. There were several bodies of military personnel that were found in the aftermath of this incident. We eventually pieced together what happened between some bodies and a few survivors, but it was too late to save them all. The ones that were mutated became stronger, faster, and much more resilient. They had increased their mass beyond what we could really understand. Thankfully, our cleanup crew was able to handle it all before things got too out of hand. I know it sounds terrifying, but our military was capable of handling them. Since the 1970s came, things changed for the worse. They were pushing for bigger, more unethical projects. Intermixing human DNA, advanced bioweaponry, and all sorts of experimentation really began happening and our military technology at the time had increased exponentially as well. Intermixing human DNA 
advanced bioweaponry, and all sorts of experimentation really began happening, with our military technology had been exponentially increasing this time as well. We were told that we would have our own alien technology within the next few years. I had start working on these few projects, but had some moral issues with some other stuff they were doing. I heard about horrific experiments on human beings, but our superiors kept telling us it had to happen for the sake of the country. We began to notice that UFO were being sighted more frequently right around military bases, and it got to a point where most of our technology was being crushed by superior alien forces. We had this massive accident in 1979 that took a massive toll on both our military and their technology. The incident had occurred in 1979, and it was just after the Iranian Revolution where they gained control of our embassy and capturing our people. The technology we had at the time was enough to cause some pretty bad damage, but not as much as it could have been. Of course, this was all just the beginning. They had more technology than what we were able to understand, intimidating us into surrendering whole countries to them without firing a single shot. We were literally at their mercy, not having enough firepower to really cause any damage. This, of course, all happened under the table beyond the sight of public eye. They are only ever a handful of people right now alive that even have knowledge of this, besides whoever decides to read this. It is the moral obligation of every single person to spread this information. The others were very much real, and this is all very true. The experiences that I've shared with you today have changed my life forever. I have so much more I can share, but I figured it's best to break these up in a smaller post. So I'm going to end this here. I'll see you in the next one. My ranking was Staff Sergeant E6, and I was in charge of a security firewatch platoon. We handled perimeter defense on the flight line and security at the Squadron Operations Center. We also manned the ODU Green Jeep Patrol on base after dark, looking for would-be intruders. This part of my story occurred back in the 1960s. I served with the 8th Tactical Fighter Wing at the Yubon Air Base in Thailand. At the time, I was a replacement airman fresh from the USA and not long in country. The squadron to which I was assigned had just turned over almost all of its aircraft to the 388th TFW, which took our F-4Ds, including my platoon's aircraft, and sent us back to the USA. My unit only had five F-4Cs left in the country, so I was not going anywhere soon. I had some time on my hands. We were on the flight line about midnight, minding our own business when an airman came screaming out of the night, heading toward us from across the flight line. I thought he was a fire marshal or an airman on fire watch, checking to see if anybody was out by the flight line. I couldn't understand why he needed to run, though. He ran up to us and was gasping for breath. He told us that we had been on fire watch during the flight line, and he saw something out over the end of the runway, 1129. He said it was a bright reddish-orange object that came in from the west, slowly crossed the field to the east. It hovered for a short time above an aircraft revetment area before slowly drifting out of view to the south. He said he stood in disbelief for a few seconds until it came back out from behind some trees. He said it was this time it slowly moved toward him and hovered over building 7357, also known as the AGE hangar. We refueled our aircraft with JP-4. He said it looked like a huge fireball with a greenish-bluish hue glow around it. He said he could see rivets in the object and what looked like a dome on top. It was about the size of an F-4C, which was about 53 feet long, with a wingspan of 38 feet. He said the dome was about 20 feet in diameter, and it had some kind of windows on ports on each side. He said it had stayed there for a short time before slowly turning to the south and disappearing behind some trees. We radioed flight control about our Firewatch Airman's report, but they said they had not reported anything unusual. They told us to keep an eye out for anything suspicious, but there was nothing else until about an hour later. There was an airman on duty at the AGE hangar who had just relieved his replacement. He radioed flight control, and he thought there was a small fire inside the AGE hangar. At first, they did not believe him. There were no reports of any aircraft being in the area. 
After about five minutes, they told him to call us for assistance. When we arrived, our firewatch airman was already there and said that he had seen the object in question, that it was hovering over the AGE hangar when he first saw it. He said it came out to the back behind the trees and was hovering over building 7357 like before, and he saw it for a second time. There was definitely something strange going on. We entered the hangar and saw a glow in the corners. We pulled our fire extinguishers off of our jeep and headed into the hangar. It was still too dark to make out much, but we could see a reddish-orange glow emanating. We could feel the intense heat, even though we were only 50 feet away. The section chief was already in there with his extinguishers, and he managed to knock down the glow. The fire was coming from a 12-foot deep vent in the floor, which was shielded by a steel grate. The fire marshal went over to the hot grate, and it became red-hot when he touched it. We all stood there in disbelief. We would later learn that the fire marshal had already pulled up the two great sidebars when he first saw the flames. We called flight control, and they sent coverall crews to help us with opening all of the aircraft revetments to see if there were any fires in the adjacent aircrafts. We found nothing that night, but it turned out to be a very eventful one for all of us. We never reported our lights in the sky sightings to anybody else that I know of, but the next morning, while eating breakfast, I informed my wife that there was a bright reddish-orange object in the sky heading toward Grand Forks, AFB, from the west. I never saw it, but she said it was very bright, and that it appeared to be a trail of some kind behind it that was warping space and time. These were her words. I don't know if this sighting had anything to do with the fire in the AGE hangar that night, but I feel it is important enough to report this incident after all these years. I'm an old soldier now, Retired from the U.S. Army after 20 years of active duty with two wars under my belt. I am also a former member of the U.S. Army Security Agency and was honorably discharged as an intercept operator. I would also really like to know if anybody else has had similar sightings or knew of this happening at Grand Forks during the 1960s. I hope somebody out there in the UFO community reads this and can shed some light on this very strange incident in my life. My sighting occurred in the year of 2011, in April, if I recall correctly, in the jungles of Indonesia. I was a sergeant at the time of my experience and expressed a desire to be posted in the jungle. It was known that I had jungle warfare training, so it wasn't too hard to convince my superiors that this would be a good idea. I was stationed at an army base just outside of a small town in Indonesia. The town is called Dumai. The base was on the coast and the nearest town to base is a small village called Bahau, and that's right around where the sighting took place. During my posting in April of 2011, I was preparing to participate in a jungle warfare exercise with my unit. I just finished conducting reconnaissance on the objective and was returning back to base when I first saw the creature. I was roughly about a kilometer away from the base and was on a road that linked to Bahau. It's a road that I'd taken many times before, the surrounding area was mainly filled with thick jungle, but it wasn't hard to spot open spaces between. We were moving along this road when I saw an open space roughly 150 meters in front of me. I looked through the trees and saw something that I can only describe as a dragon. The creature was on the ground, its wings folded next to its body. It had a long slender neck, ridged by spines that extended back to its skull. It was gray in color with dim orange patches on the side of its neck and toward the end of its tail. I was going around 35 miles an hour when I first saw it, slamming on the brakes, skidding to a stop when I reached the spot where it was sitting. I never found out what this thing was. It just went away as soon as I saw it. It was unresponsive to my presence and seemed unconcerned by me. I didn't tell anybody else about it. It didn't seem right to report something that I had no concrete proof of. It was just my word against other people's. Hell, if someone even tried to tell me this, I'd call them a liar. I still don't even believe my own sighting. The really weird thing is that I've been to Baja before and never once saw anything strange. I'm an open-minded person. If it wasn't for the fact that I'd gone to Baja before and never seen anything strange, I would think that I was going nuts. July 14, 1995 
we were dropped off to survive with a fixed amount of rations within the Pine Barrens of New Jersey. I was a new Marine. My fire team consisted of four other Marines, one Navy corpsman, and three enlisted Marines. The first night, I sent one of our group out to set up a watch rotation. The next day, he comes back scared as heck, shivering and wide-eyed. He refused to tell us what happened, so we forced him. He said he saw a thing as tall in the trees, covered in hair with big arms and red eyes. Our corpsman immediately set up a watch with him on it. That night, the corpsman went out to relieve whoever was on watch. As soon as he was out of sight, the corpsman comes sprinting back into our camp, wide-eyed and terrified. The look on his face when he said, You're not going to believe this, and told us all what we needed to know. That night, I got on watch and he told me the story. He said that as soon as it was his turn to keep watch, he noticed a pair of red eyes a couple of feet from him. Whatever it was, it kept looking for the corpsman and growling. What happened next is a little fuzzy for me after all this time, but the corpsman said he couldn't see it anymore when his flashlight caught its eyes. He said that it was making these growling noises, it was large and black, and a big black cat or a bear of some kind. The night... The corpsman went out to relieve whoever was on watch. As soon as he was out of sight, the corpsman comes out sprinting back into our camp, wide-eyed and terrified. The look on his face when he said, You're not going to believe this, told us all we needed to know. That night, I got on watch and he told me the story. He said that as soon as it was his turn to keep watch, he saw a pair of red eyes and a couple of feet from him. Whatever it was, it kept looking at the corpsman and growling. What happened next is a little fuzzy for me after all this time, but the corpsman said he couldn't see it anymore when his flashlight caught its eyes. He said that it was making these growling noises, it was big, black, and bear-like. He said it stayed right next to him the whole time, and when it stood up, he stood up. He said when he turned to run back to our camp, it began coming after him. He said the closer it got, the more he began running. He said he ran all the way back to our camp in record time. I remember us laughing because there was no way something could have chased him back. Well, the next day, we all went to look for tracks. It turned out that whatever it was, it was as tall as a man, and it had three-toed paw prints and really long claws on its toes. It may have been a bear, I don't know. After that, we never heard anything else and we were all fine. We even saw the Navy corpsman a little while ago, and he remembered it like it was yesterday. So anyway... We're all fine and we're out there and the Navy corpsman goes out to relieve who is on watch again. Now it's the third day, so I'm kind of out of it at this point. I mean, we're seeing a lot of deer in Turkey and other signs that there's wildlife here, so that's a good thing. While the corpsman is out there, everything's fine and dandy. We're all just sitting around talking about what we would do when we got out. The more I think about it, the more I wonder where he is. Just as some of us are about to stand up and go look for him. The dude who was on watch comes sprinting into our camp, saying that something's right behind him. We all look at each other and ask him what he's meaning, and that's when we all hear the growl. It sounds like a bear, but much deeper, like a weird kind of bear that I've never heard before. It is very deep, like the sound you'd hear in the movies when there's a monster. What came next is something I'll never forget. It reminded me of when my grandpa showed me the Jersey Devil's stories when I was a kid. We all drew our guns and waited for whatever it was to come into full view. We're all looking around for it. Then we see the corpsman. He's running toward us from his post, but there's something big and black following him. We all start yelling for him to run faster. Whatever was following him was not stopping. It looked almost like a large cat chasing a mouse, but a cat in humanoid form. It was the same height as the corpsman when it stood up. It was taller than any of us. The next thing I remember is seeing something black pass in front of me. Then everything began moving slowly. It was like a scene in a movie where time slows down, and all the details are there. I could finally make out what was chasing him. It came into view. It was black. It was hairy and had wings. I can't remember seeing any arms or not, but if they were, they were smaller compared to the rest of its body. Its face was feline-like, having reddish-yellow eyes glowing. Then, I saw its hands. They were almost backwards, but had very long claws. In fact, they were most likely like talons, just very large. It kept running toward us, and the closer it got, 
the more noise it made. It was like this really loud hissing mixed with howling. Just as it got closer to the corpsman, he tripped. He said something about seeing its claws going after him right before he fell. Right when the corpsman tripped, it flew up into the air. It started coming down fast when it was just a few feet from him. I remember that's when we got to him. There was blood everywhere. The thing was pissed and now dove down at one of us while trying to retrieve his body. I don't know if it was trying to take him back to its lair or wherever it is, but we were not going to let that happen. It dove at one of us, but we shot it down before it could touch him. But there was a lot of blood on the ground where he had been laying. After we shot it, it let out this scream and dove off into the trees away from us. We used this moment to grab his body, pulling him back to our camp to attend him. I remember talking about it with some of the other guys after the incident. We all believed that the thing was not from this world. We also remember what the corpsman said right before he was taken. He was screaming but eventually passed away due to blood loss within minutes of this thing tearing him open. The only thing he managed to say before his death was, it didn't get me. Our training mission was then aborted within hours after this happening. We will never forget what happened that evening, and we all wanted answers. I can't remember why, but I have a feeling someone on our team knew what it was that took him down. It was so dark. I think one of our team members saw something. We were all wondering what it was that attacked us. I'm fairly certain that what we had encountered was indeed a Jersey Devil. I can't be sure, but I have this feeling. We lost a good soldier that day. Don't let anybody fill you with these fake stories that they're harmless. He was torn open and bled out. This was no ghost or folklore. The man's gone. It's an event none of us will forget. Personally, I won't step foot in the Pine Barrens again after all of this. I was digging through my grandfather's things a while ago and came upon this report that I thought was very intriguing. This is a report from a soldier located in Falk, Arkansas. He had encountered what he can describe as the Boggy Creek Monster during a shift at night. This is his account. The date unknown. Report was given around 1930. At approximately 2100 hours, our guard posted the usual two men. Shortly after I took over watch, I heard something of the path moving towards me that was large. Thinking it was my relief, I challenged him by name and ordered him to halt. But instead of stopping... This man broke into a run. I then took a pursuit, firing several shots at him with my rifle, in order for him to stop. Not directly at him, but around him. He apparently was not hit and disappeared into the darkness. I could hear something running away ahead of me for the time. But it soon ceased its noise. I did not see a man or a dog, although it might have been a bear going through the underbrush. This would happen over the following nights, and the sentries would each time fire at it, but to no avail. We were never able to catch up with this man-like creature, but it was certainly not a bear, but I cannot say what it is. Maybe some of the wild men from the hills. I know nothing more about this matter except that I never hope to encounter it again. It sounds to me like this soldier had encountered the Boggy Creek monster. The location of this story takes us to the Ozark Mountains, not in Arkansas, but in Missouri, about 12 miles from the town where I grew up. I was a cadet slash sergeant in the Civil Air Patrol. My team and I had just finished a late night training op. We were dropping off our camping gear at the field before heading back. I was walking out towards the rear of the van, where we had already begun climbing into their bunks to get sleep before we headed off to start the rest of our day in the morning. After about a minute, I had already turned off the headlights. I started hearing some distant howling. I happened to be facing towards the west, so I was looking out over the field where we were parked in. The howling sounded like it was off in the distance, on top of a mountain. Remember, due to the time, it was extremely dark, but I could sort of make out some shapes on the horizon. I'd recognize that howl anywhere. I spent my whole life and I grew up in that area and left only to go into the service in the Ozarks. I've heard that howl too many times to count. It's the Ozark Howler. You know, where I grew up, if you've ever heard a howl like that in the distance, it meant one of two things. Either somebody's going out hunting and having a good time with beer, 
or the howler was on a spree. I immediately thought to myself, this is going to be bad. I was scared. I began scanning the horizon with my eyes, comparing what I could see of the shapes to mental images I've taken thousands of times of the terrain in my head. The last thing I wanted to do was be caught off guard. My heart sank in my stomach when I realized that the howls were coming from west, from the base of the mountain range to the east of us. That meant that there was a very high probability that whatever it was down there was now heading our way. I called my friends into the vehicle, and we started pulling all of our gear back out of the van, grabbing our rifles. I knew what was coming. We got our gear together, grabbed a couple of the M4s and hunting rifles with night division scopes. We moved into a defensive position behind the van. Everybody else around me knew exactly what this was. Having most of, if not all of us, around the vicinity of the Ozarks, we were all very familiar with the Ozark Howler. This was not a surprise to any of us at the time. Our location afforded us a very good view of the field in front of us. There were a few cottonwood trees in the middle of it, and a very small creek running along one side. The field was about a half mile in width, and about one and a half miles in length. We had a pretty good defensive position. We were behind the van, and the van itself was perpendicular to the tree line that ran alongside one of the field. The trees were about a hundred yards away from us. We had a very good field of fire. We had about a 180 degree angle of fire. Far back enough that we'd have surprise on our side, but close enough to the tree line that we'd be able to take some cover if something came at us from behind. The Ozark Howler had a very distinct howl. We knew that whatever was coming on our way wouldn't be coyotes or feral dogs. We'd heard them both before, and they don't sound anything like the Ozark Howler. The howls were getting closer and were moving into formation, making sure everybody had night vision. I was the only one with a thermal scope, which we could have used, but we didn't know what we'd be facing, and I had no idea how to even turn it on. So we're going with night scopes for the time being. As the howls got closer and the volume increased, we began to look for movement in the field. I was standing next to the driver's side window of the van looking out over the field, while some of my friends were on the other side looking out over the tree line. I have to say at this point, I was pretty jacked up. This thing had killed before, and it was coming for us. If it got to us, there'd be no escape. You have to understand that there was nowhere else to go. It was either win or lose this thing. I could hear it howling and getting closer, and we were watching the field intently. We saw some movement out of the corner of our eyes and turned to look at the tree line. I don't think anybody was prepared for what we saw when we looked in that direction. I remember it vividly, and the image is so burnt into my head. There were three of them. They were huge to begin with, but the way they moved and how their muscles rippled under their fur was terrifying. There were some of the biggest wolves I'd ever seen, but they weren't wolves at all. Their fur was a dull gray, almost white, with speckles of what looked like black mud and filth all over them. The smell emanating off of them was very strong. It smelt like wet dog and urine. The thing is that when they saw us, it wasn't a surprise. They knew we were there. We all felt it without saying anything. And that's what really scared us. The fact that they knew we were there, they didn't care. They were hunting something else. When we saw them, they stopped and stood still. They were looking at us like we were a meal. I was looking into the thermal scope, and I could see some steam rising off of them. Now, I can't overstate how huge these things were, and when they turned their heads to look at us, it made me feel very small. I felt like a mouse looking at three lions. I'm not ashamed to admit that I was afraid. We were all pretty much shaking, and we didn't know what to do. One of them howled again, that same familiar howl, and we all knew that it meant something. I don't think anybody will ever say what we're thinking at that point. Not out loud, anyway. I knew what I was thinking, though. I'll tell you why. I thought about the stories of these creatures. It wasn't just the stories of the Ozark Howler. It was all these other stories from local legends and myths. I thought about how they were supposed to be huge wolves, and I thought about those bluffs not too far from here. They stood up and turned towards the bluffs and began moving towards them. They were moving fast. It was amazing the way they could move on those steep hills without slipping or falling. It didn't take us long to get back into the van, and we drove off. 
I began reading about these creatures as more as I could, more than just hearing stories. I read about how they were supposed to be some kind of hellhound, tormenting people who live near them, and how there is supposed to be this blackness surrounding them. I have never seen something like this out there, but I can tell you what it looked like to me. They were some kind of hellhounds, there's no doubt in my mind. You know what, though? I still think about those things every day. I still think about them that night, and I wonder what would have happened if they had not turned around. If they had decided to chase us and come after us, we'd all be dead. They would have killed us without a second thought. I've never been back to that spot, not even with all the equipment in the world. I don't think anybody could make me go back there. But if you do see one of these animals, I would advise you to stay from it. I say this because if they wanted us dead, we would be dead. They turned their backs on us and walked away like we weren't even there. Beware the Ozark Howler. Not my account, but a retired Cajun corporal had reported to me. I'm a paranormal encrypted investigator, by the way about a possible Rougarou sighting that occurred on the back portion of his property, just north, outside of New Orleans, on a spring evening back in 2018. The witness was sitting on his back porch, smoking his tobacco pipe, when his eyes caught sight of some very large movements toward the back portion of his trees. It was dusk, light enough to still see, but the sun was setting. He looked off into the trees and noticed what appeared to be a large, hairy humanoid, moving towards the tree line. He grew curious, wondering if this was some kind of bear. He grabbed a light and headed towards it. As he got closer, he noticed that the creature's head was much larger than a bear's. It resembled a wolf, but it still didn't answer what this creature was doing. He grew suspicious and the witness claimed to sense something very strange. It was glancing around, intelligently, looking directly in his direction but it didn't act like the other animals do when they notice you. It did not appear to be frightened, which he thought was strange. The witness continued closing in on the creature, but did not get too close. The creature then began to walk towards the trees, but it never turned around or acknowledged the witness's presence. The witness did not want to let the creature get away, so he followed it into the trees. The witness claimed that even though it was dusk, it should have been light enough to still see. Yet... This man claimed he could not see anything distinguishable in the trees, just by glancing around with his light. He was now growing very suspicious, but he decided to stay calm. He turned his attention back at the creature, noticing it was gone. He thought that maybe it got away, so he went looking for a trail to see where this creature might have gone. The witness claimed that he found nothing. He didn't notice any droppings, tracks, or anything else that might indicate this thing's presence. The witness decided to look around the area some more, but nothing came up. He turned his attention back at home and went in. That would be when he discovered that his dog was missing. Come to think of it, he told me that his dog had been gone all afternoon. The dog had a usual routine of going potty at around 2 or 3 p.m. out in the back portion of woods to do their business and come back inside. He didn't think about it, and the dog was now gone. His mind immediately went to this large canine, taking his dog without him knowing, which would explain its presence. It was potentially drawn to his dog as food, which is why he spotted it. It could have been coming back for more, he's not sure. He didn't hear any sounds of yelping or anything, found no trace of blood or any signs that his dog had been taken or killed, but his dog after this was missing. He found it strange that when he cast light on this thing, it was so dark he said that its fur seemed to absorb the light around it. It was unnaturally dark. He heavily believes that what he saw that evening was in fact a Rougarou. He has no doubts about that. He claimed that the experience was very memorable. He had heard about Rougarous and Rougarous sightings, but didn't believe it seriously until he experienced this for himself. <laughs>